you can go now. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen to this the third um, session of uh, fundamental uh, fundamentals of node analysis and basics of two-phase flow. Um, before I start, um, as I promised last time, uh, I'd like to uh, just go back a little bit uh, to um, standing IPR method um, because um, I modified the slide a little bit. So if you, if you recall from uh, the previous session, uh, session number two, uh, when we talked about uh, the different IPR methods, we stopped at standing IPR and I, and I, and I found that uh, the equation really um, needs a uh, little modification. And I did a small revision. So you'll find that this slide is a little bit different from uh, what we um, uh, what I showed in my previous presentation. So quickly, um, what is standing IPR? So standing method is nothing but a modification on Vogel IPR, okay? And um, it, it basically works whether it's uh, saturated or undersaturated reservoir. But for the saturated reservoir in which basically the, um, the uh, bubble point pressure is higher than the reservoir pressure, which means that the whole curve is, is there is no straight line uh, for, the, for the curve. So what standing did is that standing uh, thought about the skin. That's why we spoke about the skin right last time. And then he introduced something called flow efficiency. The flow efficiency is nothing but the drawdown, assuming skin is zero, divided by the actual drawdown uh, where the skin is not equal to zero, okay? So then um, because Vogel IPR does not consider the skin, so um, standing said that, okay, that means Vogel IPR. So this, this original IPR applies where PWF is actually drawdown assuming skin of zero or what he called ideal drawdown, okay? And then by introducing the flow efficiency, he did a modification on the Vogel IPR method and then he said, basically, we need to rearrange Vogel IPR to introduce the flow efficiency. But what is the flow efficiency? Flow efficiency, as I said, is the drawdown as you're assuming skin of zero divided by the actual drawdown, okay? Which means that if, if the skin is zero, for example, that means Fe will go to one, okay? Which means that this will reduce to Vogel IPR, right? And how do we find the, um, the uh, you know, flow efficiency or flow efficiency? We say that flow efficiency is if we have, for example, um, uh, you know, current productivity index, and we'd like to see that, okay, how the, the will will produce using IP, using Vogel IPR by, by changing the, the, the productivity index due to skin, then we can say that, okay, the the uh, the new flow flow efficiency it was the current flow efficiency times j new divided by j current okay so for example if the um the productivity index has dropped for example by say from uh, 1 to 0.8 for example then this this terms become the ter this term becomes 0.8 okay so this is the new pi that means the current, the, the, the new flow efficiency is basically 0.8 times the current flow efficiency, okay? So this is in a nutshell and, and there is no really uh, major change. The only thing is that um, uh, the flow, for flow efficiency higher than one, then Vogel equation is not applicable for small values of PWF. PWF. Why is that? If you recall from, from this equation here, okay? If, if this number, if this number is higher than one, and then it's uh, raised to the power of two, then we are subtracting a large number here. That means the IPR curve will start, will start curving down, which is not realistic. And then that's why we said that, okay, for that, we are just going to use 
Q max using this empirical equation here. And then we just extend the line. We don't calculate, we don't use the equation to calculate this uh, Q basically by PWF, if, uh, you know, for, for high, high number of PWF, if flow efficiency factor is higher than one, okay? This is an example, um, and I recommend that in your free time, just try to solve this and, and try to understand what we're trying to do here. So for example, and I will just describe how we are going to solve this. So using the following data, construct an IPR curve for the will under present conditions where flow efficiency equals 0.7, right? So what do we mean by present conditions? So if we are going to use Vogel IPR, Vogel IPR, uh, IPR, IPR represents the, um, uh, you know, when, when there is no skin, right? But now we will assume that the current IPR already, okay, includes low efficiency of 0.7, right? So now what we are going to do, we are going to use this, 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 this number similar to what we have done in Vogel IPR before, but then we will assume that the current IPR that we will construct is at, at FE.7, right? So what we are going to do, we are going to use this equation here to calculate Q max, because we have now a Q test QPWF, right? Or PWF, we plug it into this equation. We have also P reservoir. We get Q max at FE equals one, right? And then we simply, go and construct the IPR using this equation here. Because we have this number from the previous equation using these numbers. And then by, by estimating multiple numbers of PWF and using 0.7 or 1.3, we can construct two IPR curves, okay? And for the part where P, uh, 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 FE or flow efficiency higher than one, we are going to use this equation for Q max, okay? Unfortunately, if, uh, I wish we have, you know, enough time uh, to actually, because normally, I mean, not analysis course is, is really a full course. We're talking about three, four days course, but we're just trying to cover the basics here in a few hours, okay? So for undersaturated reservoir, there is slight changes, and this is basically the, the changes that, that we need to apply, okay? So I, um, I, and this is another example for undersaturated reservoir. You can, you need to solve it on your own. And if you need help, you can, you can contact me on LinkedIn. We can, we can go through, through it together, okay? So we have explained all this, and now we are going to start our um, day three. Sorry for the, the, the delay, but I needed to make the change, uh, um, uh, to, to the update on standing IPR method, okay? So, uh, as uh, Mr. Nikhil mentioned, uh, we are going to have a quiz at the end of this uh, seminar today or webinar today. And don't worry, uh, I'm going to go quickly towards the end of this presentation. Today, I'm going to review the main ideas about nodal analysis and also the main ideas that, that you will be asked in the quiz. So at the end of the day, Really, this is not a test or anything. This is just to prove that you have attended and you have captured the main equation, so the main ideas. So the, the questions should be really straightforward. And, and uh, I, will, I will go and, and emphasize on the main ideas again so that you can all get certified for this course. So this is what we're going to talk about today, fluid flow and pipes and restrictions, fluid properties, single and multi-phase flow models. And as I said, uh, this subject by itself is huge. It's it's normally, I mean, if we talk about, if we really want to talk about all these subjects in in detail, we will we will need really. Uh, this is this is this can be a, a full course, right, in the university. But we'll just touch upon the main ideas. So it's important to understand that all pressure drops are function of the producing rate and characteristics of its components, right? They can be calculated easily for single phase flow with knowledge of the pipe size and roughness and the fluid properties. For two phase flow, when both gas and liquid exist, the situation becomes very complicated. 
since the average reservoir pressure change or average pressure changes of the flow, the phase changes, and then this will affect properties of the fluid, volume and velocity of each phase, and the distribution of the phases of the, or, or the flow pattern, right? So single phase is easy, multi-phase is complex, and we have, because we have, you know, saturate, we have uh, saturation values that, that will change. We have gas dissolving in, 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 in oil, et cetera. So all that will make the two-phase flow really complex. In addition to that, the temperature changes in pipe systems and restrictions add to the complication because change in temperatures ch causes changes in the fluid composition, relative volume of phases and fluid properties. The temperature changes throughout the system must be known to be able to determine the pressure changes. So quickly, when we talk about pressure drop, right? Normally, this is a, um, an equation that, that combines the three components of a pressure drop across any fluid flow in a pipe, right? We have what we call the acceleration term, okay? Uh, sorry, this is the, graf uh, the gravity term. We have the acceleration term, and then we have the frictional term, okay? So gravity, acceleration, and friction, right? So acceleration term is usually ignored. Uh, zero for constant flow area and, and incompressible fluid. Friction component depends on whether the flow is laminar or turbulent. For laminar flow, we need to use Reynolds number by simply calculating density dV divided by, by viscosity. If the number is this, then the resultant number is less than 2100, uh, then it's, it's laminar. And then the friction component is easily determined. We can directly plug in uh, to uh, you know, this equation, or in a very simple term, we just divide 64 by Reynolds number we get the friction component, right? We get the friction component, the friction factor, okay? So friction factors calculated by dividing 64 by Reynolds number, and then we plug into this equation, we get the frictional pressure drop along the pipe due to friction, okay? So um, I'm not sure if you remember this, this chart here, but this chart is very, very important. Uh, and it's, uh, it's called the Moody diagram. So what do we have here? How do we, how do we really understand this, this, this chart here, okay? So this chart on the y-axis, we have friction factor in a log logarithmic scale that starts from, from zero until 0.1, okay? On the x-axis, we have Reynolds number, okay? And now, depending on the whether the, the relative pipe roughness or epsilon divided by d, okay? The relative pipe roughness is nothing but the roughness divided by the diameter. What is the roughness? The roughness is a measure of the smoothness of the pipe. And we can measure, this is actually measured using even metric units or, or sorry, length units. This can be done by, by inserting um, a very uh, sensitive uh, needle, for example, and then we move this needle along the, the inner surface of the pipe, and then we take the average movement. So, so this is the what we call it the, the the roughness. So, if we divide this roughness by the diameter, we get what we call the relative pipe roughness, and this can be as small as you know uh, one to the power minus six, and then it can be as high as 0 0.05. Okay. So depending on these, the, 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 the relative pipe roughness, we have curves, okay? So for example, if I go and calculate the relative pipe, the relative pipe roughness to be, to be 0 0.02, for example, then I'm gonna use this chart, okay? So this is my chart, then what do I do? I calculate Reynolds number. Suppose that the Reynolds number that I got is, for example, uh, 10 to the power six or 1 million. Then I go here and then I'm gonna go straight up like that until I reach my 0 0.02. And then I'm gonna read the friction factor on the left right away. 
So this is my friction factor. Friction factor is 0 0.025, for example, 0 0.0, something like that, okay? So this is how we use the, the Moody diagram. As you can see here, if Reynolds number is, um, is low, below 2,100, that means it's a laminar flow, which means that we are here. So we go here, that right away, and then we can get the, the friction factor immediately, right? There is a transition region, and then the re remaining here is for basically Reynolds number higher than 2,100, or in other words, this is the turbulent flow, okay? I hope this is clear. And, and of course, um, today, um, Moody uh, equation is, is actually empirical. And this is what, what the software are using today, right? Perfect, so move on. Now, we need to understand certain basics for the single phase flow, okay? For turbulent flow, as I mentioned before, different empirical equations have been developed for smooth, but partially rough or completely rough pipes. For smooth pipes, the most common equation is, is this equation here, okay? The friction factor, and by the way, this, this empirical equation is nothing but a description of Moody diagram, okay? So this is just an empirical equation, right? So, if the Reynolds number is between 3,000 and 3 million, then we, we, we are going to use this equation here, right? And for higher Reynolds number, we use F equals 0 0.316 times Reynolds number to the power minus 0 0.25. This is for smooth pipe. For fully rough pipe, we are going to use this equation here. And as you can see here, this equation, um, is one to the square root of the friction. That means we need to, if we need to solve this, we need to actually take, uh, raise the both ends to the power of two. And then this is what I'm gonna show you in a moment. So this term here is the pipe relative roughness as I, as I mentioned before. Now, for turbulent flow and partially rough pipe, the Kolbrook equation is used to develop the modern friction factor charts, okay? So as you can see here, this equation here has the friction factor in the left side and in the right side. And the only way to actually solve this is by, solve this is by iteration. So, um, so uh, trial and error, we can get this equation then, okay? And this equation, is given by, if I, I can simply, I can plug in Reynolds number here and then I can directly get the friction factor, of course, by, of course, by, you know, um, uh, you know, solving the, this equation. And I remember, this is what mostly we use, what we mostly used for turbulent flow, partially rough pipe, which is the application for oil and gas, um, for the oil and gas industry. Remember, this is for single phase, right? So now, this is an example. So a liquid of specific gravity 0.82 and viscosity of three centipoise flows in a four inch pipe or 0.1016 meter. New commercial pipe, that means it is new pipe at a velocity of 30 foot per second or, or 9.14 meter per second, calculate the friction factor, okay? Using Colbrook and Jane equation and assuming uh, epsilon, so sorry, the, assuming that epsilon, this, this is epsilon equals, because epsilon is here, sorry. Epsilon is 0 0.0015 or the, the roughness, 0 0.0015 0 0 feet. So simply we calculate first the Reynolds number, Reynolds number is nothing but the density, right? Which is, if it's 0.82, that means it's 820 meter cube um, uh, per, per, I forgot the units. Anyways, uh, is it kilo, kilogram per meter cube? Then times the velocity. This is the velocity, meter per second. 
times the, uh, the diameter, this is the diameter, divided by epsilon, which is 0 0.03, because I need to, to convert this into, uh, sorry, uh, 0 0.03 is the uh, center point, the viscosity, right? So now we get this number, that means the, the flow is turbulent. We get now the air relative roughness, divide epsilon by the diameter, we get this number here. And now by looking into this equation, rearranging, I get the friction factor by simply using this equation, just plugging directly. And then we get the friction factor of 0 0.01826, right? So looking into the uh, original equation, remember this is the Colebrook equation, the original one, by iteration, we can get that the friction factor is 0 0.0181, which is very close to, to uh, this direct plug-in uh, equation, okay? Perfect, so now, moving on, I don't think we have time for this. Yes, let's start talking about the fluid properties, okay? Uh, and I apologize, I have to basically go through the definitions of the equations that will define the fluid properties, but this is important. So number one, fluid density. We have the gas density, right, given by this, this equation. And all, all what we're, we're, we're having here is that these are empirical equations that, uh, that are, or numerical equations that are basically correlations using curve fitting, okay? So this is how we calculate the gas density. For oil density, we have uh, either below the bubble point or above the bubble point. So for, for below the bubble point, we are going to have this equation here. So this is the, um, what we call the, uh, the uh, oil density, and this is the API, right? So the, uh, or basically in, in, if, we, if, if we, we need to calculate the API, we just rearrange. So the API is uh, the, uh, the, the American Petroleum Institute, or it's a, a, a value that, that indicates, this is what, what normally we use for indicating or for uh, describing the oil density, right? So, and this is the, so this is the specific gravity, sorry, and this is the density, okay, of oil. And as you can see here, the density of oil takes into consideration water density, uh, sorry, oil, uh, oil density, because, um, uh, yeah, just a second. No, this, is, this is for the units, okay? So uh, this is the solution, this is the solution gas. This is the formation volume factor, okay? And, um, so by, by, by looking into the solution gas, as you can see here, we are, we are using also the gas specific gravity, right? That's why, you know, it really depends the, the uh, because we are below the bubble point, we need to, to know how much we have gas in solution. And that's why we're using the solution gas, right? And the formation volume factor, okay? And all that is just to calculate the, um, uh, the 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 uh, oil density, right? Uh, when I say water density, I, I mean that this is this is the uh, the um, uh, uh, oil specific gravity by looking into uh, by dividing by the water density, right? So for above the bubble point, we have this equation here, okay? And now talking about the fluid velocity, so. We have what we call the superficial velocity. Why we have superficial velocity? Because in oil and gas, gas, oil, and water rates are normally known at surface conditions, right? To calculate the in situ velocity, standard flow rates must be corrected to in situ conditions. What do we mean by in situ? In situ is the, is the um, um, I would say, the, conditions at given location, pressure and temperature, okay? Like for example, when we, if I want to know how much is the, uh, is the velocity of each of the phases, I will need to know 
how much is act is the volume of each phase at certain pressure temperature, okay, and uh, diameter. So this is the in situ, right? If we talk only only about let's say liquid and water, liquid and gas. Sorry, assuming that oil and water are are, are moving in, in 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 the same phase, then what we do basically we can define the superficial gas velocity by the flow rate of the gas at in situ conditions divide, divided by the overall diameter. And how we get that? Well, basically we, we, we get the gas specific, uh, sorry, the, the gas uh, flow rate as standard conditions times BG, which is the formation volume factor of the gas divided by all the overall area. Why it is superficial? Because we know that the uh, when, when, when we have two phase flow, right? We have portion of the, the area is occupied by gas, portion of the area is occupied by liquid. And that's why you cannot really divide by the overall area. That's why we call it superficial, okay? So this is the superficial gas velocity. We also have the super, superficial oil li liquid velocity, for example, okay? So that's why, you know, um, we need also to to uh, calculate that for the uh, for the for the liquid, and then be using using the two phase flow correlations, we can determine or the hold up concept. We can determine how much is the is the actual velocity. Okay. So, if gas is constant with oil in the pipe piping system, solution gas must be subtracted from measured. Separator, separator and tank gas before calculating the in-situ velocity. What do we mean by that? If I want to know <coughs> how much is Q gas, then I have to subtract the producing gas liquid ratio minus the solution gas liquid ratio, okay? Times the formation volume factor. And this is, this is for the uh, you know, uh, for this for unit conversion, okay? So, and this is this is how we calculate the, the formation volume factor for gas, okay? So, this is to get Q gas, all right? We know QO, QO, and we know that some of the gas will be dissolved, okay? And if we want, we, we, if we want to know the, the in-situ conditions, we subtract, as I said, we subtract the producing GLR at certain, uh, you know, um, condition minus the solution G GLR or the, the, the gas and solution. And this is how we can get Q gas at certain position or certain pressure and temperature, okay? For the oil velocity, we can, all, we can also use the superficial water or oil velocity, right? And this is again by QO, BO divided by the area, okay? Similarly for water, okay? And as I said, these are superficial, why? Because it's not actual. We need later on to introduce what we call the holdup. In the, and the holdup actually will adjust the superficial velocity for the liquid or for oil or for the gas, okay? We have also the gas compressibility, the gas compressibility, there are charts for that. And this is an, an empirical correlation. Unfortunately, as I said, I don't have time really to go into all the details, but uh, this is for your, your reference. So um, the compressibility, as we, as we all know, what is the gas compressibility? So Z factor is nothing but a, an adjustment to the ideal gas equation that will uh, you know, basically uh, correlate the pressure volume and temperature. So we introduce the gas compressibility because the gas, we know that the gas is not ideal and how we can get the, the, the compressibility factor by plugging in this equation here where each of the terms A, B, C, okay, is given by, by these empirical equations or, core or, or numerical equations, okay? This is how we calculate, again, the gas compressibility and, and the different uh, pressure and temperature. So one of the also important terms that we need to understand is the, um, 
what we call the critical gas velocity, okay? When we have two-phase flow, we have the ability of um, the liquid start to, to kill the well, okay? Under certain GOR values, if we have if we have high condensate value in a gas well, there has to be a minimum gas velocity to actually lift the liquid droplets into the surface, okay? There are a lot of research in this area and just to calculate what is the uh, minimum or the critical gas velocity below which if I don't produce the well, uh, you know, um, under, under this minimum velocity of the gas, then the liquid drop, drop out will, will, will fill the well uh, or kill the well at the end. And we call it that the liquid is loaded. Uh, sorry, the, or, or the oil will, the gas will is loaded with liquid. Okay. So, so this is how we calculate the, um, the minimum flow rate. Okay. The minimum flow rate is minimum gas flow rate or the critical gas flow rate is given by 3.06 times the minimum velocity, okay? The minimum velocity times the a area of the tubing times the well head divided by temperature and this is the Z factor at given pressure and temperature. If we have water, then the minimum velocity is given by this equation here. If we have condensate, then the minimum velocity is given by, by this equation here, okay? So we, we have the, uh, this is the well head pressure, okay? So depending on the well head pressure, we will calculate the minimum velocity to carry out the condensate. We plug this minimum velocity into this equation here, and then we can get the minimum flow rate of the gas, right, at standard conditions. And below, below this, this flow rate, as I said, we will have a problem of liquid loading, right? So this equation here gives us the, um, the bottom hole pressure, PWF to the power two, right? By knowing only the wellhead pressure, Exponent of a, a number called S, S can be given by this term here, okay? This depends on the gas specific gravity, the true vertical depth and the average temperature and the average disease factor in the well, plus this term here. So this term here is, if we, we need to know the gas specific gravity, the flow rate of the gas at standard conditions. This is TZ also, right? This is the friction factor. This is the measured depth. And then exponent S, the same S minus one divided by S D to the power five. By the way, although this equation looks a bit complex, but it's, it's beautiful. Why? Because using this correlation, we can immediately find the flow and bottom pressure given very few parameters. We just need to know what is the flow rate at the surface, what is the diameter, what is the measured depth, okay? What's the friction factor? And then the average T and Z and voila, we can get now the flow and bottom pressure, okay? This will be very useful if we want to construct our outflow or VLP curve, right? Because we can, we can assume multiple rates. This is the this is the, the flow rates, and then for each of the rate, we can get the PWF or the flow and bottom pressure. Okay. Now, when we talk about two phase flow, things are more complex. The estimation of pressure drop requires values of flow conditions, velocity, and the fluid properties. And that's why we need to, to define the liquid holdup. What is the liquid holdup? So it's the volume of liquid in a pipe element divided by the volume of the pipe element. Meaning, if we consider that we have a pipe of, of constant cross-section, 
So at, at any cross section, we look into how much of that cross section occupied by liquid, we divide it by the volume of the pipe or the area of the pipe, then we can divide, define the liquid holdup. The liquid holdup is, is extremely important in two-phase flow. Why is that? Because by knowing the liquid holdup, we can then adjust the velocities. And by knowing the velocities, we can calculate a lot of the pressure drop. So all the, the, the pressure drop calculations due to friction depend on the velocities so that we will need to know how much is the individual frictional pressure drop for each of the components. And then we will start talking about the correlations, the mechanistic models, because now each um, friction factor will depend on the phase, right? And the phase, the fluid, the flow regime will depend on the holdup, okay? So let me just explain more. So holdup is a function of gas and liquid properties, flow pattern, pipe diameter, and the inclination. It cannot be determined analytically, only empirical correlations are used, okay? So this is the holdup. There are the number of correlations out there just to calculate the holdup. So what is the, so if this is the liquid holdup, what is the gas holdup? The gas holdup is nothing but the, what, it's one minus the liquid holdup, okay? So <clears throat> we can really to define the no slip liquid holdup. So what is the no slip liquid holdup? Mean, no slip meaning that there is no difference in the velocity between liquid and gas. And of course this is, this is impossible, or this is non-realistic, but this is one of the assumptions that a lot of the many, uh, the number of correlations are used. Like for example, Dunson Ross is known to be a two-phase flow correlation that assumes no slip, right? And no slip uh, assumption is valid and important in certain calculations because without that, we cannot uh, determine uh, specific uh, fluid properties. So, Let's define the no slip liquid holdup. So the no slip, no slip liquid holdup is nothing but the flow rate of the liquid divided by flow rate of the liquid divided plus flow rate of the gas, right? So this makes sense, right? Because if we assume that the gas and liquid are moving in the same velocity and they are moving in the same pipe, then since the flow rate um, is a volume, right, divided by the area, then we can simply define the liquid holdup, the no slip liquid holdup, by just dividing the liquid flow rate by the total flow rate. We can also need to define the liquid density. So the liquid density is nothing but the frictional or the weighted average of um, oil fraction times oil density plus water fraction times water density. And then if we are going to, you um, need to know how much is the fraction, it's basically the water, the water cut in other words. So the, for, for water fraction is the water cut, or so the percentage of water in the liquid, right? So that's why you have a fraction of oil, fraction of water. The mixture density is now we're now now we start to see why we're using the holdup, right? So the mixture density, considering we have a liquid and gas, is the liquid density times the holdup or the liquid holdup plus the gas density times times the gas holdup or one minus liquid holdup, right? So we have three forms of the mixture density. We have number one, which is used for the elevation hydrostatic term. Number two, this is another way. So this is just a weighted average. This is another way of calculating the mixture density by looking into the no slip, the no slip holdup, okay, of liquid and, and, and gas divided by the actual holdup. And this is number two, this is used for no slip correlations. And then number three is used for the frictional term. This is using, again, using using the, the um, no slip holdup, okay? 
So talking about now the superficial, remember we talked talk, talk about superficial gas velocity, now we talk about the superficial liquid velocity. So this is again, superficial liquid velocity dividing the flow rate of the liquid divided by the total area. Superficial velocity of gas is, is the, is the uh, flow rate of the gas divided by the total area. And then the mixture velocity is nothing but superficial velocity of liquid, superficial velocity of gas. We add those, we get the, what we call the mixture velocity, okay? Now, this is assuming superficial values of the velocities. If we need to uh, calculate the actual phase velocity, then we simply divide the, the superficial velocity of the liquid by the holdup. Because suppose that we have 70% liquid, 30% gas, right? So that means the, the, the overall area is occupied by 70% liquid, 30% gas. When I calculate the superficial liquid velocity, I am dividing by a bigger area, right? Because only 70% of the area is occupied by liquid. So when I say, for example, flow rate is 10 divided by the, 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 the area, I am saying that the liquid is moving in a bigger area than actual. So the actual liquid velocity is actually higher. Why? Because we need to divide by a smaller area. And that's why we divide the superficial velocity by the holdup. This will give us higher actual velocity. And this is also for the actual gas velocity. Then finding the difference will give us the slippage velocity or the slip velocity. I hope this is clear. So this is the um, liquid viscosity, mixture viscosity. Similarly, we have different terms. Again, we are taking the, 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 uh, either the no slip holdup or the actual holdup, and this is the surface tension. Why I'm introducing all these parameters? Because all these parameters actually are used in the two-phase two -phase flow correlations, okay? Now, talking about the uh, flow pattern, So as you can see here, each of the, when we, when we move gas velocity, uh, when we move gas and liquid in the same pipe, okay, the, the two phases will form different, what we call flow patterns. And this depends on how much gas and how much liquid we have in a pipe. Let me, Let's just understand this, this chart here, okay? Now, assuming that we have a flow loop or a transparent pipe, and then the pipes are moving vertically, we have two valves, one valve that will control the gas flow rate, another valve that control, con control the liquid flow rate. And you can use here air and water. And then we are forcing the two phases to move into the same pipe, same vertical pipe. On the x-axis, since we know the diameter of the pipe, we can calculate the superficial gas velocity because we know the flow rate. Divide by the flow rate, the, divide the flow rate by the area, we get the superficial gas velocity. Divide the liquid flow rate by the total area, you get the superficial liquid velocity. So we can have this chart by changing the superficial gas velocity. So assuming that we have fixed. Superficial liquid velocity of 0.2 meter per second, meaning I know the liquid flow rate. I am fixing the liquid flow rate and I'm not changing that. I'm only changing the gas liquid, superficial liquid velocity, uh, so, uh, gas superficial velocity by increasing the gas flow rate that will go into the pipe, which means that x axis is constant. Uh, sorry, y axis is constant because I have fixed superficial liquid velocity. And then I'm going to, going to move from left to right by increasing the gas, the superficial gas velocity. 
So in the beginning in this area, if we have 0.2 superficial liquid velocity, and between 0.2 until almost 0.8 superficial gas velocity, we have what we call slug flow. As we start to increase the, or the gas, the free gas the flow rate start to increase, we will move from slug flow in, into a form of flow called churn flow. And then if we continue, we can have what is called froth flow, and then we can go to the annular flow. The annular flow is mainly gas in the middle, right? Pushing the liquid to the surface, okay? That's, this is when we, when we have, as I said, constant liquid and increasing gas. Moving vertically now, if we have, for example, fixed 0.4 superficial gas velocity, and we start moving up, 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 up. Then once we reach, for example, 0.8 uh, meter per second superficial liquid velocity, we can start to have what we call the bubble flow, okay? So this is in a nutshell how the flow patterns are determined, okay? And in order for us to convert these lines or these boundaries into, um, you know, something that we can use in the software. That's why we, we use the mechanistic models or the two-phase flow correlations, okay? This is for vertical flow. This is for horizontal flow. We can have stratified plug flow, slug flow, wavy, slug wavy, and et cetera, et cetera. And this is using the same, um, you know, experiments. However, in order for us really to see the effect of the different flow patterns, we really have to increase the velocities to much higher numbers. And that's why we're using now Reynolds number instead of, instead of the superficial gas and liquid velocity, okay? So horizontally, we can move from stratified flow into wavy flow, into wavy annular, and then into slug, uh, into annular, sorry, okay? And, and so on. So this is, this is, again, very important to understand um, the complexity of two-phase flow and how we really need to convert that into something that a software can use. This is the challenge. And that's why if you go to any software, you find a lot of what we call flow models, okay? Or uh, flow correlations or mechanistic flow models, etc. okay? So <clears throat> if you recall in the beginning, we, we said that the uh, pressure drop is composed of frictional pressure drop. And for that, we need to calculate the frictional factor, uh, the friction factor. And now we talk about the pressure term, okay? So the pressure term, dp by dl, or the pressure drop along the length due to elevation is nothing but G by GC. So this is just the, just the graphic, gra, 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 gravitational constant. GC is just a correction factor, right? So this is if, for example, we're using metric conditions, this can be 9.81, for example, meter per second squared, times the mixture density from this equation, if you, if you recall, sine one. So now this depends on the angle, right? Of course, for horizontal, for vertical pipe, this is the maximum. And as we scroll down, if we go to horizontal, then this becomes zero, okay? There is no elevation term for uh, pressure drop for horizontal flow. This is the frictional component, okay? So these are different, depending now on the uh, flow pattern, we need to use the, the, the different friction factor. Look into this, uh, this term here. It says here, good, good for bubble flow. Remember what was the bubble flow for, for, for uh, you know, uh, for vertical pipe here, bubble flow. Remember this one here? So bubble flow is, is what? What does, what does the, uh, the, uh, the, the inner surface of the pipe see? Does it see the bubbles or it sees the liquid? Well, it sees the liquid mainly, right? Because now we have mainly liquid and then the gas bubbles are 
you know, trapped in, into the liquid, okay? So that's why for a bubble flow, we have this equation here that says, okay, friction factor of the liquid, density of the liquid, and then we're using the superficial um, liquid velocity, right? Divided by 2D or 2GC. This GC is just a, a correction factor for the, for the gravity term. But if, if we have missed flow, what is the missed flow? Missed flow is when we have mainly, mainly gas, right? Similar to, you know, um, the annular flow, for example, but mist flow is nothing but, it's the completely the opposite of the bubble flow. Mist flow is mainly gas with droplets of, of, of liquid. And that's why for mist flow, we have all the terms here related to, to, to gas. We look into the frictional pressure drop, a uh, friction factor for gas, gas density, and gas velocity. However, the most mostly common used is the um, the mixture. Like for example, we need to look into the two phase friction factor and just don't underestimate this value here because this value is very complicated to calculate to the two phase friction factor. And there are a lot of literature to cover that. Then we will use the mixture density, the mixture velocity square divided by 2D, okay? So again, why this is complex, okay? The two-phase flow is really complex because for the same mass flow rate, relative volumes of phases change along the pipe. When we have two-phase flow, if I, if I start say at certain depth, I go to, for example, 500 feet more, then the relative volumes, the volume of gas to liquid will change because we will have different saturations, different, uh, some gas will come out of solution. If we have for higher pressure, more gas will go into solution, right? So that's why, and this is for the same mass flow rate. That's why this is complex. The distribution of phases, the flow pattern changes, changes and difficult to determine also. Fluid properties change along the pipe and are difficult to determine as well. Pressure gradient is a function of inter interdependent variables, and it is impossible to obtain analytically, or using the or, or to, uh, to obtain the exact estimation of pressure gradient. So that's why we cannot know hundred percent how much is the pressure drop for two phase flow. That's why we use correlations, or uh, mechanistic models, or even sometimes artificial intelligence for that. So historically, since the 40s, researchers kept on developing correlations for predicting two-phase pressure drop, and the efforts still continue. Until today, for example, I mean, in my, in my company in, in, in Schlumberger, where, where we have uh, Olga software, until now, uh, actually yesterday I attended a presentation, our scientists are still working on improving the calculations of the pressure drop for, you know, the, the high definition to calculate the film, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's not something easy. The first developed correlations were purely empirical and generalized. These result, resulted in great errors when used outside the, the range of variables used in, for, for their development. Then several correlations were developed for predicting the flow patterns. So initially they did not consider the flow patterns. Then later on, the flow patterns were, were introduced into, the, into, into the, the correlations. This led to the development of empirical correlations for various flow patterns. These correlations were more accurate than generalized correlations, but still produced large errors under certain, certain conditions. Recent developments constituted mechanistic models where various flow patterns transitions were estimated based on mathematical expressions. So not only we, we introduce the flow pattern, but also we introduce also the transition between the, the patterns from let's say bubble flow to mist flow to angular flow, et cetera. All that, the, the transitions are actually taken into consideration 
using the mechanistic models with the, with the use of mathematical models, okay? These models experience the same accuracy of the preceding correlations, offering better predictions only for certain conditions. The most recent development utilizes artificial intelligence or machine learning, okay? Developed models based on artificial neural networks produce the highest accuracy compared with the best available correlations and mechanistic models. Several empirical and semi-empirical correlations and mechanistic models exist for predicting pressure down with vertical deviated good wells. Several studies have been conducted to compare and evaluate most available correlations and models. Most of these studies did not cover field conditions similar to those in the Middle East. Um, I just need to mention that um, um, I did a paper. Uh, this is the this is the, the the paper number. I mean, this is uh, maybe probably ten years old. So I'm just trying to brag here, right? <laughs> the work of Ahmed Shamari is showing the great potential of AI for accurate prediction of pressure drop. Okay, let me just show you my the, the result that I found. So what I did is that I used a big sample of well test conditions, and this is for vertical wells. And what I did is that I used the different correlations, two-phase low correlations, in predicting bottom well pressure. So we have well testing data where we know the well depth, well head pressure, GUR, water cut, API, etc. And then what I did is that I used, of course, software to calculate the pressure drop for, for all the most of the famous correlations, Donson Ross, Fancher and Brown, Hagdan Brown, Orkizevsky, Biggs and Brill, Tron Experts 2 from Prosper, and Mukherjee and Brill. And then I developed a neural network model, or it's not really neural network, it's actually a, a hybrid between fuzzy logic as well as neural network. And I call it uh, adaptive neuro. Uh, fuzzy inference system. So this is not what I call it. This is what it's called. And I use MATLAB for that. What I did is that I used the, the uh, it was, I think, 800 samples of full testing data. So I used 600 samples for, for training the model, 200 samples for testing. These 200 samples did not see the training models. And then I used the this AMFIS model or the adaptive neural fuzzy inference system to predict the bottom wall pressure. And guess what? It actually beats all the correlations. So this is the average error between the predicted value and the measured value. This is the maximum error. This is the correlation coefficient between the predicted value and the uh, measured value. This is the root mean square error, and this is the standard deviation, okay? So what I'm trying to say here is that sometimes machine learning data science, okay, can give you um, better or more accurate results. However, new, I mean, neural networks or machine learning are not, it's not really physics. It's just, um, you know, finding the relations between, between the data. That means the objective was actually to predict the bottom wall pressure only. We don't know the, the, the um, this numerical, sorry, um, AI methods or, or machine learning methods will not predict what's happening uh, along the wellbore. It doesn't know friction factor, doesn't know friction pressure drop, hydrostatic pressure drop, knows nothing. This is not physics. All these correlations are physics. So um, when, I, when we say that this is more accurate, it is more accurate, but it, it's just a mathematical method, right? A mathematical model. There is no physics in it, and that's why it cannot tell you what's happening along the wind board. Okay. So how we how does the, the two-phase low correlation work? Well, well, number one, you need to divide, or the, the software will divide the wind board into segments. Okay. And then we know we'll head pressure. We need to predict bottom wall pressure. So what we do is that we need to assume P2. We have to start with an assumption. And then we get the, we will assume that for this segment, the P2 is, let's say, for example, 
P1 plus or will it pressure plus certain value, say for example, 10 PSI. So we get the average pressure for this segment. Then when you calculate the average pressure, we used using the GOR and the formation volume factor for oil and gas at the average, we calculate the liquid holdup using, of course, the correlation. Sorry, the, the direct, sorry, no, we have a uh, GOR volume, well, we can, can directly predict the holdup. We determine the flow pattern based, based on the holdup and the inclination angle. We calculate, so, and this is all step by step. We calculate two to phase flow density at the, the average. We calculate delta P average because now we have uh, the holdup, we have the density, okay? We find the Reynolds, uh, sorry, we, 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 based on the density or uh, the average density, we calculate delta P due to gravity. We find the Reynolds number and friction factor. We calculate the delta P due to friction. And then the pressure outlet P2 is calculated based on P1 minus delta P total. Okay, so, um, and, and by the way, why, why we're saying, why we're saying minus because, because, um, you know, it, it, this could be a negative number because we're going down, right? But eventually P2 should be higher than P1, considering that, that we're going down, right? We compare P2 with the initially assumed P2, if they match within a tolerance, then consider P2 to be <coughs> the inlet pressure for the subsequent segment. Otherwise, we consider P2 assumed to P2 calculated and go to step two. So this is how all the software work. It's an iterative process, right? So I think we are almost, uh, let me see, how are we going with doing with time? Uh, just a second. So, okay, very good. Oh, we're almost done, huh? So good, so we're, uh, I need to, to speed up a little bit. I need to give you a good review before we, before we stop today. So this is the effect of, sorry. I mean, all of the format is uh, killing me. So I'll, allow me just to use these slides without presentation mode. This is the effect of um, different variables on the pressure drop. So as the GLR or gas liquid ratio increases, what will happen? It will basically, since the hydrostatic, the hydrostatic column will be less, that means the pressure drop will, be, will go down like this until if we have a very high GLR, then the friction drop will start to become dominant. This is the effect of the diameter, okay? As the diameter increases, the pressure drop will decrease, of course, um, because we have less friction. Um, then this is basically effect of the tubing size. And I remember I explained this, we said that we cannot really increase the tubing size a lot because uh, we will reach into a point where the uh, velocity will not be enough to lift the, the, the oil. And I think with that, um, I'd like to really stop here. Let me just, uh, because I need, I need to make a quick, uh, sorry, quick uh, review, okay? So if we are going to swap, that's it. I think that's, that's Q and A. So solve in the, uh, in the in the quiz, right? So yeah, thank you. Keep the the, the, the recording. So I will go stra straight away to the very early uh, slides. Um, just a second. So let me go here. This is important. Okay. So this will be a question, right? We said that the total system the overall production pressure drop in a production system from the reservoir until the separation facility is constant. It will not change, okay? What will change? The flow rate will change if I change the pressure drop of any of the components. Meaning, if this is constant, the total pressure drop is constant, then if I manage to reduce the drawdown in the reservoir, what does that have, what, what will that mean? It will mean that I'm gonna produce more, right? 
by reducing the drawdown, in, in other words, by making the uh, drill a horizontal well or, or reduce the skin or make a, a side track that will reduce the drawdown in the reservoir, that means I'm going to produce more, right? When I produce more, because this delta P is less and I'm producing more, delta P across everything will increase to compensate. If I change the choke setting, if I close the well, I'm going to increase the pressure drop, right? But since total pressure drop is constant, that means I'm going to, the flow rate will be less so that the, because this is higher, the, flow, the, the pressure drop across everything else will be less because we have less flow rate. I hope this concept is clear. So, P reservoir might, might be separated, it's constant, but I can change the flow rate of each well by looking into the pressure drop across the components of the production system. Just keep this in mind, okay? Um, we talked about inflow and outflow, if you remember. Okay, and then, so for example, we said that we have uh, inflow and outflow. You need to know which parameters affect the inflow and which parameters affect the outflow, right? So we said that the inflow represents the effect of changing the reservoir parameters to the bottom hole pressure. Again, y-axis is, is the bottom hole pressure, x-axis is the flow rate. So this is the inflow. So this parameter here, P flow on bottom hole equals P reservoir mass delta P in the reservoir. When I have a question, I, um, if I, for example, um, if I ask you, is the tubing size, does the tubing size affect the inflow or the outflow? What's the answer? It affects the outflow, right? Because the tubing size has nothing to do with the reservoir. It's an outflow component. Similarly, tubing depth. Or if I want to trick you, I tell you the reservoir depth. Is it an inflow parameter or an outflow parameter? You have to say it's an outflow parameter. Why? Because the tubing depth will affect the hydrostatic component. Okay. If I tell you, for example, the productivity index, is it an inflow component or an outflow component? You have to tell me what? It's an inflow component because it affects the pressure drop in the reservoir. Skin, is it an inflow or outflow? It is inflow component, right? So when I tell you the choke size, is it inflow component or outflow component? You have to tell me outflow component. Why? Because the choke size will affect the well head pressure and so on. Fluid properties, GUR and water cut. Is it inflow component or outflow component? Considering that we're not talking, talking about Darcy equation. So fluid properties, water cut and GUR are going to affect what? Are going to affect the hydrostatic in the well which means it's an outflow component. Okay, good. So move, moving on. Now, what if I ask you, let's say going to, remember this equation here? This is Vogel IPR, okay? So you need to remember how to use this equation by just plugging in the flow and bottom pressure and the flow rate, and you will get Q max. Then you have Q max, and then you can use this equation to construct your IPR. I hope this is straightforward, okay? And we solved this example last time, and this is how we calculated Q max, for example, okay? I want you to also remember this. I want you also to remember that we have if we are under saturated reservoir, under by the way, I added this text here. So under saturated reservoir is when the reservoir pressure is higher than the bubble point pressure. Saturated reservoir is when the reservoir pressure is below the bubble point pressure, which means that all the curve is, is using this equation. When the reservoir pressure is higher than the bubble point pressure, we are going to have two parts. One part is linear, another part is Vogel, okay? 
So for the linear IPR, this is the equation to calculate J or the productivity index. So J equals Q of the liquid divided by the drawdown, okay? Or P reservoir minus P the PWF. Um, and this is for standing, I believe. Um, and then we, we, of course, we talked about the IPR for horizontal wells. And then finally today, we spoke about different coral, different flow properties, uh, including holdup. We said that the holdup is the volume of the liquid divided by the overall or the amount of uh, of the cross section occupied cross section of the pipe occupied by liquid divided by the total uh, you know area of the pipe. And we looked into the different you know. Um, properties. With that, I think we're done. Um, Nikhil, 